This is the sound of worlds beyond number. In a rose quartz corridor lined by red polished wooden doors outside the small yet stately office of the bursar of this sanctum of the scepter's chorus, wizards of the Kemsarazan Empire, we see one guild mage pain, a tall, sorrowful faced man leaning forward with a slashed arm, having just simulated an attack on himself with his right hand now filled with crackling lightning, his eyes luminescent white as he lunges towards Ursulon, unaware that there is a fox in his office or a wizard and a witch at the end of the hall that know what is happening. I am going to need everybody here to roll initiative. Oh, God. Yeah. Son of a gun. Suvi, you are a hundred feet away, but you are first to act knowing that something is wrong. You hear a clattering of steel and your Citadel training kicks in. You are first to act. I don't know what's happening yet. Can I move down the hallway but hold an action? Yes, you can. You just start sprinting and it takes your entire turn to sprint around the corner and you see another 50 feet off uh, the scene unfolding before you. Ursuline, I'm gonna need a dexterity saving throw. 17. Lightning crackles, but you pull back at the last possible second so that only some raking edges of the crackling static in this wizard's hand touches you. You will take half damage, <gasps> nine damage halved to four. Mm. The spell that this wizard is wielding is not mighty. There is a reason this wizard has been shunted into the administrative corner of a far-flung chantry at the edge of the Empire's reach. However, this is the first time that wizard's magic has touched Ursulon in this way. There is something crisp, otherworldly, and yet not of your other world. Mm. There is something beautiful, symmetrical, yet static and sterile about this magic that unfolds. Uh, what's going through Ursuline's mind as you feel even this diminished result of this spell? Uh, I mean, I think Ursuline already wasn't in the best place walking into this situation. There really was no plan that wasn't going according, like, and he was just improvising. I think as Ursuline feels the magic, he's just immediately wanting help. Uh, or to flee. I think there's just a desire to not be in this interaction. It, it already didn't go according, and it doesn't feel like there's anything to salvage here. And with that confusion and horror, it is your turn. I will use a bonus action hidden step uh, to turn invisible. As I go invisible, my eyes dart to the end of the hallway where I see Suvi. Mm -hmm. I, I think I'm going to start T uh, taking steps toward uh, moving towards Suvi. You are able to join Suvi's side. Okay, great. Mm -hmm. You feel Ursuline's presence, uh, but I don't speak. There's just a little bit of that, like, the mom hand that slides over as she feels you pass by her. And she's like, all right, done. And it just rounds. And I, you see it. You saw it as she was running. Suvi is furious at this fucking hedge mage that touched her <laughs> friends. There is a look of panic in the guild mage's eyes as you suddenly vanish and he realizes that you are more than you seem. I am still with the other acolytes, yes? Yes, that's correct. I wait the situation and I say you must move quickly, get somebody in authority, get Moro. There has been an attack on our party. Go ahead and give me a persuasion check. 19. Two of the acolytes, hearing the sternness in your voice, uh, bow almost reflexively and sprint down the hallway. I use my movement to get to where my friends are. Suvi, it is your turn. Mage. And I'm going to send... Uh, <laughs> I'm going to close to 30 and cast Witch Bolt. <laughs> roll an attack roll for me, if you would be so kind. A 10. 
you throw a witch bolt at this uh, guild mage. You see that Pain throws an arcane shield. The witch bolt interacting with swirling, intersecting, overlapping circles of runic language. And you can see something vile, which is a sneer of contemptuous joy as the guild mage pain successfully resists the spellcraft of a citadel mage. You will explain yourself now. Pain sees you, leaps into his office, slams the door shut, uh, and uses his action to lock it. What? <laughs> <laughs> it is now Ursulon's turn. The invisibility ends, uh, and I think Suvi and Abe regard a very sheepish Ursulon. Is, um, things did not go according to plan. I... It was my mistake. Do we need to? Are you okay? I'm. Uh, yeah, I'm fine. I just. I'm. I messed up. No, that's okay. No. I. I did mess up. He messed up. No, I messed up. I said Will Gallows. Oh, well, yes, but no, he messed up. He deigned to hurt a companion of a mage of the Citadel. <gasps> You're fine. You hear in your mind, Ame, the fox speaking to you and saying, uh, the guy is doing something in here. What is he doing? <sighs> he's, Just describe um, his actions. Describe his actions. Okay, you don't have to his one hand's going up and his other hand's going down. <laughs> uh, <laughs> now they're together again. Thumbs up and... Ah, oh, ah, hot, 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 hot. <gasps> Foxes on there, foxes on there, foxes feeling hot. I'd like to run back down the hallway. <laughs> you run back down the hallway, you get to the door. Ame, it is your turn. Fox, are you okay? What's happening? Uh, it's hot in here. It's hot. It is hot in there, or are you hot specifically? I don't. I feel hot. How, how do you tell? Okay. Uh. Uh. uh it is not hot anymore. Oh. Oh, he was definitely burning some incriminating documents. Okay, you should attack him. Okay. Yes. Him in the throat. Uh, the fox is going to attack. Go ahead and give me an attack roll for the fox. Ooh. That's a natural 20. <laughs> yeah. Ursuline, you're right outside the door. You hear a sort of <sighs> conflagration. Of, uh, you can almost smell almost like smoke and flame from the other side of the door. And you suddenly hear a... <laughs> and a... God! Uh, <laughs> as the guild mage takes two points of damage. Suvi. Now I'm going to hold my action as I like catch up to Ursuline. Oh, there's a bloody dagger on the ground, yes. right? I'm going to go ahead and pick that up and pocket it. And then I turn to you and say, mind getting the door? Yeah, happily. And I'm going to hold my action to attack when I have line of sight on him again. Great. He's going to go now and trapped on the other side of the door as he is with the fox, I'm afraid to say he's going to attack the fox. This is Brendan. There were only seven episodes. <laughs> <laughs> and you're already attacking familiars. People love to pop off, and then they and then they end up finding out about what bad people do when you uh, pop off around them. Oh, he's so bad he'd attack a fox. <laughs> a, fox a fox just is... bit the hell out of him. So I said, go for the throat. Yeah, is he still attached to him? Uh, yes, he is still attached. Okay, mm -hmm. good to know. The fox's uh, hit points are two. Oh! Oh, or actually, let me double check that. Oh my God, is this I fox in the back? The fox is... Can we walk Hold back? on. Yeah, Reddit, Reddit, can we Reddit, wait? Reddit, Reddit. Can uh, we need to go back. Yeah. yeah. Reddit, can we go back? 2 HP? Everybody, is everybody's it? made a lot of choices in quick succession. Is it? 2 HP? Let me double check here. Please. I'm going to roll this in front of the board. Ah! <laughs> on a nine or higher... Oh, you got to be kidding me. ...hits the fox. Uh... Oh. <laughs> oh. That is a two. Oh. Oh. Yes. Oh my God. Uh, the, wow, uh, we fully tried to kill it. Oh, wow. <laughs> oh. Hey, Eric is gone. 
You guys, everyone's got to protect your little fuzzy guys. Because if you send them into the room with the bad man, oh then the bad man's in the room with your little... On. My it, fuzzy guy? Everyone always wants to put it on me. You're attacking foxes out here. If you are in your home D&D group, I'm going to say something very clearly right now. I'm going to say something very clearly right now. If you go in the kitchen, you might get burnt. And if <laughs> if you're sending your familiars and your companions and your various little animals and constructs and buddies, if you're sending them to get up in the mix, they're gonna get got. Hey, Look, they went in the I kitchen. Know that, but Ame doesn't know that. There you go. I went in the kitchen to get cookies. All right, I didn't, <laughs> I didn't go anywhere near the stove. All right. <laughs> If you walk you in the part of the kitchen that go- just has the pantry, you're going to get burned. <laughs> when I set that fox in there earlier, that was never my intention. <laughs> um, so you hear from inside, and Ame, you can still feel telepathically. The fox has latched onto his leg. The guild mage has tried to like rake down with lightning in his hand again. And uh, missed. The fox has like wriggled on the other side of his leg, still sinking his fangs into this wizard. Uh, uh, poor showing from our wizard friend here. Um, that is now going to go to be Ursulon's turn. The strong man of <laughs> Silsbury will take the door. Here we go. <laughs> go ahead. Give me an athletics check. <laughs> it's a DC 15. Oh, God. God. Damn. Level one is hard. I really don't like it down here. <laughs> That's an eight. This is a straight up eight. Copy that. Ursulon, you <laughs> lean back, get your shoulder in front of you, and slam into the door and hear it shudder against the door frame, uh, uh, remaining closed and locked. Uh. <laughs> Uh, Ursula, any bonus action? Can I try again? <laughs> uh, uh, go ahead and I'll, I'll say on a bonus action, give me one with disadvantage. Okay. Two 11s plus four, 15. Yay! Yay! Uh, oh my God. There we go. So uh, uh, you, uh, you go and back up all the way against the edge of the hallway and run. And finally, this time, uh, uh, slam the door wide open into the room. Wait, can I use my held action? Oh, yes. Absolutely. Now that's open. Uh, Suvi's going to wrap her hand around her staff, the staff of the citadel of a true wizard and her father's ring, her ring glows green as I summon one of the level spell slots that I keep inside it to cast magic missile as my darts bend around Ursulon and light him up. Go ahead and roll damage for magic missile. 12 plus 3 is 15. That would kill me. The darts springing forth from Suvi race through the air and impact with shuddering, explosive force on the body of Guildmage Pain. The pure destructive energy radiates first through his ribs, his shoulder, in through his lower back and along the sort of side of his abdomen. He falls to the ground, bleeding from three enormous injuries on his body. And you can tell is holding on to, uh, he's immediately unconscious, dropped to the ground, holding on to the last tethers of life. Uh, and we are out of combat. <sighs> Ursulon doesn't like how this happened. Uh, doesn't like uh, how much blood <laughs> is gushing out of this man uh, and is going to uh, lean down uh, and without making eye contact with Suvi, uh, cast lay on hands uh, and give him one hit point. You lean down, you give him one hit point, which will raise him from unconsciousness. He will not be making death saves. Um, he comes to on the ground Looking at the three of you, I am going to need some kind of charisma-based roles to not have him spring into, you know, like survival mode, essentially. It's not going to be for me. Suvi is just, uh, she's about to, like, I think 
Sufi has reached into the pocket and has pulled out the bloody dagger and is attempting to finish a kill in the same way that she finished Captain Emelis on the on the ship. That's 19 from Ame. 14 from Ursula. Ame, you can perceive that he is probably going to continue. He, he cannot accept the situation. This, there is no surrender in his eyes as he comes back to one hit point. It's over. There is no escape from this. If you talk with us and tell us what is going on, you may yet have a chance to escape the clutches of Gallo. I don't know what any of you are talking about. There is no proof of anything. There is no... And what even thing would there be? Do you think that Will Gallows will wait for proof? You hear a noise of approaching footsteps rapidly, and you see Maro and several of the attendant mages come in. Ursulon is injured. He doesn't see a knife on the floor, but he does see a lot of blood on the floor. And he sees all of you standing over, uh, he sees all of you standing over pain on the ground in his office with also just like a bunch of ash around in there. Um, Maro goes, Good heavens, what is the meaning of this? What is happening? I'm not quite sure. Perhaps this was some... Big misunderstanding? And I look at Pain. Uh, Pain looks... <laughs> what? <laughs> <laughs> the craziest flex I've ever heard in my he life. He <laughs> looks at Ame and looks up at Moro and says, A little bit of horseplay. <laughs> Gone out of hand, Guild Mage Morrow. I'm afraid. You see, Bear and I. He's he is covered in blood. Blood is running out of his mouth. He, blood is running out of his mouth. He's covered in ash. There is a fox with its fangs sunk into his leg, still going. And he's like, we. Realized that we had summered, he and I, on the same beach village outside of Silbury, and were engaging in a rustic bout of indoor croquet, which they play there. Something but, we often did. Something we often did. But <laughs> outdoors because of the beach, but we were doing it indoors. That's Silly. That's so silly. We were so silly. Yes, we were silly. Mm. So, realizing we were silly, I <laughs> burnt all of the mallets and croquet balls with magic. And then we were putting the rest of the gear away, and Ursula Bear was admiring my knife. And in admiring it, he turned around, and I accidentally uh, walked into it. And then... Sufi is disgusted and walks away. And then I cast Magic Missile on myself <laughs> because I was frightened. And that spell never misses. <laughs> so that was the type of horseplay... Fox, uh, <laughs> you can probably stop playing with him. Yes, Fox, we have finished. We have finished. You did so good, buddy. Fox, let's go. Licks the blood off his fangs. And see, he looks around. He loves a good lie, but he looks over and you see he pads over to Payne's head, who is still like lying on his back. And you see he just whispers in his ear, I'm going to eat you one day. <laughs> Here, Fox, I have a vote for you. And I take out a little treat from my pack. <laughs> <gasps> my vote! Uh, <laughs> it leaps up and, uh, and and eats it, gobbles it up. Um, uh, so Morrow goes, I'm going to be very honest. All of this behavior is the most outrageous tomfoolery I've ever heard of. To think that you were playing croquet <laughs> inside this chantry and roughhousing with knives and casting powerful, offensive magic 
on yourselves is completely uncalled for. And with your earlier rudeness to our honored guest, the Archmage Apprentice Suvi, I must say, Guildmage Payne, I am going to be writing a report and I will be submitting it, encouraging my superiors to relocate you to a diminished office somewhere of less significance than Port Talon. Oh, well, that's such a shame. Please like, don't. No. Please don't. I, 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 our silliness, kind of, it, it should not reflect back on him. But if you must, I understand. No, no, I must. And you see, he says, I must see to the apprentice archmage. And you see, Morrow leaves this open crime scene and just sprints <laughs> after Suvi down the hallway. Uh, Hildmage Payne looks up and goes, <sighs> What do you know about Will Gallows? We know that he has something that we want, and in return, he wanted you. So how do we give him you and still let you live? The choice is yours, because we are not leaving here without what we came for. You promised me to Will Gallows in exchange for something of his that you desire. Yes. It's possible that I might be able to keep my life, but find a way to make sure that you get what you want as well. There is some very critical research up in the library that may have some indication of the sorts of things that Will Gallows is interested in me for. It's possible that, given just a minute or two, I might be able to root around and find something of value to him. Try to make an inside check? Yeah. Yeah, we're all... 14. Uh, 13. Uh, I rolled a natural one. Um, (laughs) uh, This guy uh, is flop sweating. His eyes are flicking back and forth. He is trying to be helpful to you. And I think sweet little village witch Ame and deeply dreams in his fairy heart of being a knight Ursulon are watching a guy that you have approached only with honesty and forthrightness who is a nasty gambling debt wizard motherfucker who is only in this moment trying to lie to you to get far enough away to flee forever. So here's what we must do. We will split up into... Don't lie to us. Do you think just because you're a wizard with training from the Citadel, you can fool us? We have been nothing but open and honest and kind. And if you give us no other choice, we're going to give you over to Gallows. I understand. What ideas do you have about how my life might be saved? Here's what I will tell you. We were instructed to cut your ties with the Empire and that Gallus would take it from there. So that is what we're going to do. And now you knowing this means that you have a head start and that is as much as we are willing to give you. You will let me flee? Yes, because we will still be fulfilling our end of the bargain. But it's up to you not to get caught by Gallows. Give me a persuasion check with advantage. That's a 17. He stands up, looks at you. You have destroyed my life. Please stall for as long as you can. And he sprints down the hallway. We have to stop doing this. <laughs> the amount of times we've interacted with a mage and then watched them run away, <laughs> fearing for their life. is not a great pattern. No. <sighs> it's 
Suvi, yeah. uh, as you've marched away, uh, you hear Morrow rounding the corner. Uh, Apprentice Archmage. Um, uh, uh, Suvi turns around, and as she rounds on him, uh, it's that, I mean, he would understand it too. Everyone that came through the Citadel, children were trained to be soldiers first. And the more, like, tests you passed, the longer you got to stay, the more you had a dream of not simply being a frontline fighter, but all of that training was still there. And Suvi is trying to calm down the adrenaline of a child raised for battle and is trying to put it away. And that's what he sees when uh, she turns around. Apprentice Archmage, I am so very sorry. I understand how upsetting it can be when servants act no. outrageously. Your you. man-at-arms should not no, have been played. stop. I told you I had no intention of speaking to you about what some of my work entailed, but part of it involved... And I think there's this pause where Suvi has fully committed... She has committed herself to the death of this man and is going to give the game away. We, I, had intel that there was some embezzlement from this chantry at the hands of Guild Mage Payne. And when I sent my man to go speak to him of it, Payne attacked, confirming my suspicions. You know as well as I do, embezzlement, that is treason to the Empire, with a death sentence. Have you any proof of this crime? Attacking your servant is by itself enough for us to... So, the croquet, that didn't happen, or... <laughs> I'm just trying to... No. He, okay, so... No, the croquet did not happen. So he just burned those malice and balls for no reason. He burned the evidence of his malfeasance. And I'm going to pull the knife out and kind of throw it at uh, Mara's feet. That's Gilgamesh Payne's knife. You see, he picks it up. <sighs> Very well. Uh... Effective immediately. The Guild Mage Payne is stripped of all rank and title within this chantry. Um, she looks at his attendants and says, please go see to the Guild Mage's prompt arrest. Uh, and the mages sort of flank out and begin moving through the space. I am grievously sorry that, uh, uh, first of all, why was I not told directly that one of my subordinates was a, a thief and stealing from the Empire? My hope was to collect evidence to present you with. Out of respect for you and the work you do here, I wanted to come to you with an easy solution and an understandable set of circumstances. Thank you. Thank you both for... But why did he cast magic missile on himself? <laughs> that was me. I did that. I cast the magic missile when he attacked Bear. Oh my God. It all checks out. No, you it's have fine. an answer for everything. It's, okay. I, thank you. I. Mm. Indoor croquet? I was wondering. The thing that got me was <laughs> yeah. the wickets. How that, do you get the wickets right? in the stone floor? Like, I understand we're kind of here on the fringes of the Empire and they get fucking weird, but like, no, no indoor croquet. That's nothing. I, I, I won't lie to you. I know, I know in my role as administrator, I have been failing. It is because I have given everything to my role as lead researcher. When you see the Derek tonight, you will understand why I have been lacking in my diligence and observation of the minutia of the Chantry. And I think in this moment, Suvi realizes an opportunity to, like, 
consolidate a bond. And she just reaches out very simply and touches Maro's like elbow and just gives a little nod. Um, he looks up at you and you see these sort of big watery blue eyes well up with tears. I was not given much, but I was given enough. And I knew that if I could stay focused, I would be able to contribute something. And you see his lip quivers here. I would be able to contribute something that mattered, something that other mages greater than myself would see some merit in. I, I wish that my work might be a simple stepping stone to achieve things greater and more glorious in the direction of what I have started. I will see uh, uh, my my attendants are, I'm sure, arresting Gilgamesh Payne right now. Let me, for once, turn my attention to the mundane, the material, and the imperial and see to the effecting of this arrest. This will be handled. The ship will be ready tonight. You have your leave of this place here, of the city itself, the research library, or if you wish as well, um, your, uh, uh, if your, your man-at-arms, who I saw was injured, that we have an armory, if there's anything that, uh... Thank you. Yes. I will avail myself to that. Yes, of course. Um, and, and the ships will be ready tonight at, at, uh, uh, at uh, half past ten. I very much look forward to seeing it. Ame and Ursulon, uh, you look through ash, ash and books and ledgers. It looks like he was pretty, you know, he, he... Someone said the magic word that told him his life was about to be in shambles. And he uh, did the first thing he could think to do as an Archmage apprentice of the Citadel rounded the corner, which was jump into my office and burn all this shit. Yeah. <laughs> you see the fox looks up and goes, that guy tried to kill me. Yeah, he did. And I'm sorry that I put you in harm's way. I'm sorry I put you in harm's way. You know, you were, you were around. Something could have happened. Well, yeah, but I mean, like I told you to attack him and, and if he was going to. I was in harm's way before I attacked him. You what? don't have to worry about harm's way. I'm from the forest. You're in harm's way all the time. Could fall down a hill, break your leg, get caught in a trap, drown, storm, freeze to death, starve, not get enough food. It's easy. Harm's all around. Yeah, well... Not in the forest. When you care about someone, you try to mitigate that harm. And so this is my promise to you to always try and make it so that there's less harm around you. If I see any harm coming for you, I'll make it did it. <coughs> You'll what? I'll get it. What did you say? I, I, I said m mitigate. That means make it go away? Make it less, yes. Yeah. Okay. If harm comes for you. I'll mitigate it. Yeah. Thanks. You know what we sh really should mitigate is uh, all this ash and blood everywhere. This place is bad now, huh? Yeah. Holy yes, shit. this place is bad now. <laughs> Let's go find some of that uh, that fish slurry and uh, mitigate that. You know? <laughs> Am you I know, using it right? You know what? I'm proud of you. You're using a new word in a sentence. There you go. That's how you mitigate it. <laughs> that one was left. No, but that's that doesn't okay. work. That doesn't work? Okay. All right. Well, we'll you, keep, you gotta keep trying until you get it right. And, you know, if you do that, you will mitigate mistakes. <gasps> Yay! And we're back. And we're back. Okay, I got that one. I get, I get what it means. I get what it means. We, we go to find Suvi. Yeah, I'm going to pull up alongside Ame while we're walking. Yeah, I think it, it was just quietly following the fox standing next to you. I, I, it was... I, did, I, had, I had no idea what I was doing. You're not used to planning. It's okay. Uh, to be honest with you, spirits and where ever witches lie kind of aren't big on plans and following them. No, but 
feel like if we keep doing this, it's going to keep happening the same ways. Yeah, that's true. Sufi's going to step in and to handle it. And it's impressive. And I just, I, do, I don't, I don't like being carried. I don't like you carrying me. I, I should be able to, I should be able to handle myself. That's not really how it works with us. Just like I told the fox, you know, you mitigate harm around you as much as you can. You're not a burden on anybody, okay? And look, I'm still getting used to this too. I don't, there's just things here in the city that don't make sense to me. And if I am being honest with myself, I don't want Suvi to see that. This is, this is different. She went off and she became this big fancy city wizard. And I, you know, this is really different than that summer on the farm where I got to show her the ropes and look like I knew what I was doing. But I'm really out of my element here. And I think you're feeling a little of that too, but (sighs) okay. Here's the deal. We're gonna do our best to learn and observe and not make more wizards run away, fearing for their lives. Um, And and maybe it's okay if we ask Suvi for some pointers sometimes. Yeah. We gotta make it clear because it's not we're dumb. Not that not that we're dumb. We're not dumb. We're not dumb. We're capable. Yes, we are very capable. We're just capable in other ways. Yeah. Everybody's got their strengths. Yes. I mean, I'm the strong man. So yes. I, <laughs> I have to stop saying it. I you took really down like that door like it was nothing. The second time. <laughs> well, you, you, we got there. We, we got, got there. there. <sighs> All right. We'll do better. We'll do better. You round the corner. Suvi, I think Morrow has already gone off to sea towards pain. Um, probably you're actually back in your orders at this yeah. point um you all reconvene and you see that uh sort of running into the room already come you see that like no matter how kind of frightening and traumatic things are that the fox is already completely back to neutral he's great yeah. <laughs> he's resilient he's, he walks up he looks up at you suvi and he goes <laughs> i don't know how the hell you bit that guy standing so far away but i'll tell you this i set him up you knock him down I just want to offer him a little bitty fist bump. He paws. Oh, ooh, a little I don't like loving that. paw on your on your <laughs> fist. I kiss it. I don't know. Thank you. <laughs> Weird. Are you okay? I'm yeah. fine. Yeah. How about you? I'm fine. You brought him back. I couldn't. It just felt like it didn't have to go that way. And it was my folly that it did. What do you mean? Well, I just, I wanted, I, it felt good that I thought that I could be the person who would, would help, you know, that I, that I could sneak in. And so I said, I do it. And then the opportunity availed itself too. And I did. And then things didn't go well and everything went, uh, everything went sideways and he ended up bleeding out and so I to I took that upon myself it, it, it did not have to go sideways in that way Ursulan, he's going to die if not in his office Will Gallows will kill him we consigned him to death the moment we told him why we were here what do you think you did well I'm, I'm sorry Sufi I'm not as no. Good at this as you are. I no, I I'm sorry. Things are different in the Citadel. It's hard here. But the law is clear. Treason is met with death. At our hands or an outlaw's doesn't really matter. But I appreciate your penchant for mercy. I, uh, I don't, I don't know. I mean, I was performing at a circus two, three weeks ago. Now I'm deciding if, if, if 
if wizards should live or die here or die there. It's, it's just, it's a lot. It's. I haven't really ever traveled much outside of the village, and this is all bad. It feels bad. I, it's like the rules that I spent my whole life learning are just not applicable here. And, and so I'm, I'm sorry if I, I seem like I'm trying to question you or anything. I just don't know. Please help us, Sylvie. <laughs> I guess that's really what we're after. Yeah. Uh, no, no, I, oh God. Uh, and Sylvie just goes over and makes sure like the door is like closed and locked and kind of brings everyone as far away from where anyone could overhear. You're, you're fine. I'm, I'm sorry. This is, this is, this is the thing they train us for. It's not good, but... But how do you know? Like, how do you know that that man should have died or or what to do? Like, you always know what to do. I mean, that's... You spent the last 15 years training with Grandmother Ren. I went to the desert and survived it. I All I know is how to make hard choices but it's the first time in my life I actually have to make them and it's not easy for whatever that's worth. I'm sorry. No, don't, no one, no one should be apologizing. Yeah, and when those kinds of decisions become easy, I think is when we have a real problem, so. Yeah, maybe. <sighs> okay, well, we fulfilled our end of the bargain. Yes, I mean, we can, we can go get Wavebreaker now? I mean, it, it, it can. I, I kind of want to see whatever Mara is working on. There's something deeply wrong with that Derek out there. I mean, you, you guys saw that they're the wands? Oh, the, the, the large tanks? Yeah. It feels like they're preparing for war. The, the, the Azure Battalion, you mean? The, yeah. They're going to fight. I mean, you saw those big barrels, and I saw wizards earlier in the research library bandaged. All of this feels wrong. It doesn't feel peaceful or calm at all. And maybe if we spend just a couple more hours, we can have a better insight on whatever's happening. I agree. And I taste the salt water in my mouth and a knot in my stomach. It isn't magical or anything like the tangled roots that were there before, but is deeply connected to this place and whatever is happening. Um, so we'll, we'll see the Derek and then, then treat with gallows. Yes. Also, do you want some armor? Look, what? look <laughs> I kind of run this joint now. Uh, we can go and go get some stuff. You want some stuff? <gasps> I mean, you did say there's a war on, on, on uh, you know, coming, and I, I would like to be better prepared. I, I mean, I've, I think I, I have this, I have this cheap sword that I got from Finley that I didn't even have. It was in my bedroom. So, yeah, I would, I would take something, uh, something better. Let's go our outfit our little guardian, a little, just staring yes. up at you like a <laughs> little guy. All right, all right. <laughs> Uh, hell yeah. Um, so you have a couple hours to kill. You head over to the armory? Yeah. 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 Shopping. Shopping. Uh... Um, so you have a couple hours to kill. You head over to the armory? Yeah. 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 Shopping. Shopping. Uh, uh. Incredible. Um, so what I'll add, what I'll say is this. Um, anyone who wants to can give me an investigation mm. yes. or an arcana. Oh, those are things I like and I'm good at. Can I have help from the fox? Yes, the fox will help. Shit. <laughs> yeah. And I will do I, I will uh, do guidance cool. for, for anybody who needs it. Oh, oh, can I have it? Take yeah. it? I'll take it. Take that guidance. Do you mind if I take your familiar and... <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I can help you out. All right, thanks, fox. 
Um, so I, so I'll be honest with you. We got some really good rolls in here. We got, we got a dirty 20 from Ursuline. Yeah. We got a 17 over here. Yeah. And we got, what did we get over here? We got 23. 23. So the three of you having had this quite harrowing afternoon, violence in the halls of the Calabell Chantry of the Scepter's Chorus with Guild Mage Payne, who has apparently sprinted out of here, unclear whether he's been captured by the attendant mages and Guild Mage Morrow, the head of the Sanctum. You had came to blows. Uh, Ursulon was injured by wizard's magic for oh. the first time. Oh. Uh, not, not grievously so, but nonetheless injured. And you find yourselves walking down one of the court's hallways on the ground floor as sort of a warehouse and more kind of technological industrial holding areas of the sanctum give out and flare out from the tower's base. So you're sort of no longer in the sanctum proper anymore. You've walked down a kind of interior passage. You see that there's windows on either side that face out to these like white gravel court uh, courtyards and walk into an armory, as it is so called. The armory is sort of a, immediately I think for Ame and Ursulan, your idea of what will be awaiting you is instantly dispelled as a very quiet, meditative, wooden room uh, unveils itself. Something like being in uh, a well-appointed study. There are small blue fabric chairs. The things here are a little bit less ostentatious than in the Sanctum. No, no one's trying to be impressed. But even so, it gives way more of the feeling of like, a drawing room in a private manner than it does of when you think of an armory. Uh, large wardrobes are filled with azure coats, sort of military coats. You see that the only things that are visible at the moment are the coats in the open wardrobes, and there is an entire wall lined with these imperial war staves. Um, there are uh, sort of, there's one little section open that you see is, it first looks like a bench, but you realize that the front of it can be sort of lifted up. And at this moment it is slightly ajar and there are just a lot of boots underneath there. Uh, your investigation checks were quite high. So for our purposes, this is almost a combination investigation check and luck check. Um, what you would realize Suvi in this moment as well uh, is there's a lot of stuff in here. Um, there, you know, there's no one in here taking care of it right now. You're in the sanctum. Like all the people that would stop you from get the, the point of this place is that it's available to the soldiers <laughs> who need it. So there's yeah. not someone here uh, sort of guarding it. But normally, you know, there would be a process of checking this stuff out. You probably don't need to do that, but it's rude not to do it because someone will get in a lot of trouble if something just goes missing. Uh, I think that you know that your station here affords you the license to do whatever the hell you want with consequences, yeah. right? Um, but I think the important thing is the big set piece is sort of these staves. Uh, there's an entire wall that should be full of them, but of course, many of the Azure Battalion have there. So there's space for about 60 and there's probably 14 left up on the wall. So much like being in a pool hall where all the cues have been taken off because they're being used, there's just a couple of them left. Um, that being said, there are drawers set into the wall, cabinets that are all closed. And looking at them, you're sort of going, where would big pole arms and swords and axes be? But of course, this is a wizard's armory. So it's a lot more uh, genteel and sedate than that. And Ursulan is immediately crestfallen. <laughs> oh, no! <laughs> <laughs> um, I, immediately on your investigation, I will tell you that more than half the room you're able to quickly rule out. The boots, they're magical. They will not fit Ursulan. The jackets, they're magical. They will not fit Ursulan. <laughs> okay. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Come on. Ursulan is like looking like at a rack at the gap and being like, if I go more to the to the right, do we get larger? Do we get larger? No. Or try, a Ame, medium? Ma, Ame's behind him trying to, to sort of... Uh, yes, could you stitch it? Is that possible? It, trying to mend it to stitch it. And of course you're looking... So lumpy. And of course you're looking at Ursuline's you know, glamoured self holding a jacket that absolutely yes, I'm five feet 
I'm five <laughs> inches taller than I like. Even my seven foot one is not my full size. Yes, exactly. Um, so, so funny. Uh, I, I've definitely, I definitely rip two or three ropes to start. Just to start. Just oh, oh I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. It. Uh, I thought. Nope, you're maybe good. it would. I thought it was would stretch magically or something. Nothing. Right. Uh, uh, thank you. Just pass that over here. Uh, Suvi is sitting with the ledger, kind of keeping track of what we're grabbing, and she'll just start passively mending everything. Like, go ahead, take your time. Yep. Mending. Um, I'm pulling things off the rack, and and as if a fashion montage is yeah. happening. Ooh, try this one. Suddenly, of I course. See. <laughs> oh, no, uh, Suvi. Yeah, here we go. <laughs> mending, mending. Oh, mending. Maybe just a here. Okay. I think so, you're like a hat guy. Oh, maybe you're not a hat no, guy. No, no, Sufi, please. Yeah, got you it, like got it. you get a hat that can perch. <laughs> you get a hat that can like perch on your head, Looks but like it's one of those sort of cavalry officer's hat that has a chin strap and it won't not even close. <laughs> just fully blocking my eyes. Do we think do we think this could could I just it's Oh, the, no, sorry, sorry, sorry. The look. Can you just remember what this looks like and use your magic to replicate it? Yeah, but that's Come on, Suvi. Okay, I'm sorry. Come on, Suvi. I'm sorry. Uh, Ask me that hat. (laughs) I think also, Suvi, you'd be aware that some of this stuff, the jackets and hats and boots, for example, bear the crests of the Azure Battalion. So it's not wrong for for you to, I mean, it does magical stuff. I wouldn't fault you for taking it, but it will lead to interesting social interactions as opposed to some of the stuff in the armory that's a little bit less. Like, so the number one thing that I actually want to even make you roll for, uh, I'm handing a little (gasps) index card across the table. The, the first thing you see are the Imperial War Staves, but I'll let Suvi describe you because you can see what they do and what they're called. Yeah. I'll let Suvi take it away and explain whether Ursulan wants that or not. <laughs> uh, Suvi watches. Uh, af- after you've grabbed a couple, uh, I was like, can you just, hey, go grab a matchstick. Oh, all right. Uh, I guess I'll take one of the staves down. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So they're, <sighs> look, the. As your battalion and any sort of war mage, all of this is, yeah, you can hit it with the pointy end, but okay. it helps you cast magic more effectively. Mm. Cantrips mostly, because these are all <laughs> shit wizards, but they're good at hitting stuff. We love cannon fodder. Uh, it's, so it's like a, a straight, a stri- like, like Suvi's staff. Oh, Suvi's staff is meant to like wield status and respect. These staves are all bound on either end with brass studs into a leather sort of harness or sash Mm -hmm. that allows you to shoulder these staves. So you can carry them over one shoulder when you're marching. Uh, They come off, they're wielded in two hands, but you see that the way they're wielded, they're not like quarter staves you've seen. Like, yes, you can hit people with them, but fundamentally you see that there is an end. And because these have seen some use, you see where the slang term matchstick comes from, which is that one of the banded ends is covered in a little bit of soot. Mm. And that these are basically for firing firebolts, cantrips, things of that nature. They need help to cast cantrips. Mm. Gross. Uh, <laughs> is this like like the things that I make? Oh, you know. How I, how I put magic into little things, and then I'll give them to people. Is it like that? Kind of. But yours are... Uh, and I think you see, Suvi kind of just, like, shakes her wrist a little bit, and she's still wearing the, like, sort of no longer charged charm bracelet. Uh, no, because the magic on these is sort of permanent. I think yours are sort of... One and done, right? Yeah, it's permanent. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah I, I whole... pick one up and I and I inspect it. Go ahead and give me an Arcana check. Nine. Oh no! <laughs> you really don't understand some elements of this. It has a permanent magical effect on it, and it's up on the wall like candy in a candy shop. The full weight of the Imperium. The Citadel, what it means to have something like this. These staves were made by people who didn't know the names or faces of who would end up using them. But then what if they're used for bad things? What do you mean? I mean... These are all used by soldiers of the Imperium. I mean, I, I don't mean to sound naive here, I, but people are people, and this is a lot of power for just a person to have in their pocket. 
Ame is probably is reacting to the mass production of magical objects, but you're also aware of how not powerful these magical items are. One of the things about these staves is they don't have any spells in them. They literally don't, a normal person picking this up would not be able to do anything with it. It relies on the wielder already being able to cast a cantrip. All they serve to do is take a spell you can already cast at will and make it a little bit more accurate. Yeah, uh, and thinking back to like the actual systems inside of the Citadel, like the pooling of magic where like we have whole systems where uh, low level wizards dump their spell slots into pools for better wizards to use. And like Suvi's mind kind of like, I think uh, Ame would see Suvi like go away a little bit in her own head uh, as she imagines like the more impressive versions of like all of the magical items she's seen and all of the like incredible like industry around magic. And, uh, Instead of speaking to any of that, see, we just kind of nods and tries to, like, oh, well, look at what Ursulon's found. <laughs> yes, Ursulon is definitely like having a real kid with a present he didn't want energy at this point, <laughs> which is like he's holding the matchstick and being like, this is, oh, this is yeah, mm-hmm. <laughs> mm, yeah, I bet. And, but like, kind of leaning over to the drawers and, uh, kind of looking for Suvi's permission to start opening more stuff <laughs> to find anything else. I, yeah. I'm just really fascinated by this because mm. I just, I don't understand quite the, it, it all is very technical, I guess. But I, I would really love to to have a chance at some point to study these and to see if there's a way uh, to do something like this again. What do you mean? I mean, oh, just yeah, you can have one. Just more, yeah. Yeah, take one. Okay. I just pull out the ledger and put two matchsticks and then cross it out and write <laughs> Imperial Wars tapes. All right, Ursulon's done. Ursulon's opening other stuff. Yeah, okay. Cool. Go, 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 go. Uh, so I'll go ahead. We'll resolve this initial investigation check. Um, I'll say on a uh, on a 17, um, on a 17, Ame, Ame, er, uh, Ame opens a, a cabinet next to, or actually at the edge of the line of jackets, you see that on a little stool wrapped up in wax paper is a stack of fabric that you realize, it's like a thick stack of fabric that are all in squares and you realize they're little uh, kind of diaphanous bandanas. They have, there's a wavy cream and green pattern to them. Uh, and they are, they're, but they're there in a stack like sort of like freshly laundered napkins and there's a ton of them. Oh. Um, I, I keep saying that I don't need more fabrics and things, but then I, just get, I always think that there's just a little project that I can use it for in the future. Uh, it's like when we were leaving the cottage. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> you recognize these because these appear to be more like uh, of, a, of a texture that doesn't seem, it seems that this has been like requisitioned from a local more than it has like come from the empire. Uh, you find a stack of these. A magical Etsy. Yeah, you find a stack of these. <gasps> Wow. Oh. So, and you recognize why this like local chapter of the Azure Battalion has needed them. Uh, this is a little stack of witch fire veils. Uh, they're just for wrapping around your nose and mouth while you're out dealing with like dangerous magical smoke. Essentially. Oh. Oh. Um, so Ame finds that uh, off in a corner, you find the good stuff that actually probably Ursuline could wear without uh, clocking too much social heat because yeah. they're pretty, they don't have any crests or symbols on them, which are just golden bracers uh, that go on the forearm. Uh, they, they're, they are of like sort of a hardened leather, essentially. Very light, good for spell work, not very heavy, uh, but they're, you know, they're like handy. They have a minor abjuration on them. Um, see, he's got big mom energy wherever you are. Like, try these on, sweetie. Okay. Uh, <laughs> all right. Yes. Uh, oh, these fit. <laughs> yeah. And the last thing, Ursulon, you open a, you're looking at a bunch of empty drawers and you open a big wide drawer. The drawer is almost like four and a half feet wide, but very shallow. It's only like a few inches tall. And as you open it, you see these lovely certain like black velvet surfaces with all these little slits in them. And then you see that uh, while it is mostly empty, there are rows and rows of rings, mm. like a jeweler's shop. Ooh. You see that there are several, uh, there are bronze rings, copper rings, and coral rings. <gasps> mm. 
So you would know off the top that that it's only safe to wear two magical rings at once. Um, also, these are not marked with the Azure Battalion. These are way wider use within the Empire in general. These are sort of Citadel-made, mass-produced uh, magical rings. Um, go ahead and you can give me a give me an Arcana check. Um, and what'd you get? What'd you get? Twenty-eight. Yeah. I was going to say 15 gets you one, yeah. 10, uh, 20 gets you two. Uh, you're able to instantly identify all three of these types of rings because the Azure Battalion are all kids that are all usually people that were at least assigned to be wizards going forward and they fight magically. There are a lot of rings that are made to basically bolster their innate abilities for non-combat purposes. So these rings are all basically like non-combat, uh, for non-combat jobs. You know that the bronze rings are called stewards rings, which is basically to give to wizards that have to do cargo, longshoremen, porter, kind of carrying and unloading stuff. The copper rings are scouts rings, which are for, you know, Watchmen, scouts, people that are on guard duty. Uh, and then there are these coral rings, which you actually haven't seen these before, but you just look at the little room. There's a, uh, you can see an arcane mark in the velvet uh, that you can just speak the sort of Irulean, you know. Uh, and you realize these have been called sailor's rings. So steward's rings, scout's rings, and sailor's rings. And I'll give them to you and let you interpret the game abilities into yes. what Subi ah! would be able to say. I think <laughs> Ursuline just kind of grabs a handful of them. <laughs> ah! like, um, Subi, I found these. Oh, okay. What do <gasps> they do? And would they fit on my fingers? <laughs> these magical rings, you know, are... Um, a little bit less shoddy than the Azure Battalion stuff their Citadel made. Yeah. They will resize. <laughs> mm. oh, the coral. Where is where's the coral from? What kind of what kind of coral is it? I don't, I don't know. And I just hand you a ring so you can stare at it oh. while Subi just sort of oh. contemplates all three. Okay, we're gonna put the bronze rings away because that's for uh, you know, like someone that would be carrying bags, and I don't want that on you. Mm -hmm. But the copper. Okay. Copper is good. <laughs> this is. This is a scout's ring. Okay. Uh, it will help with uh, perception. And I think since you are not only the strongest man in Silbury, oh. but our <laughs> protector, <laughs> it'll give you, it'll help you get the drop on whatever we come up against. That, that sounds, that sounds right. Oh, uh, yes. Uh, yeah, I immediately put the bronze rings back. I don't like them. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> That's like, I think there's something, there, there's enough, like, Suvi has enough internal bias, like, that, like, oh, when you see that, you're like, ooh, gosh. Um, give me an insight check, Ame. Uh, 21. I think that you can see, as Suvi sort of discards the bronze ring, there's an element of judgment in Suvi about what the bronze ring signifies that you would clock, I think, a little bit along the same vibe with this whole chantry in general of the kind of things wizards look down on. I mean, if, if it's about carrying things, I carry a lot of things. Can I, can I, can I look at that one? Yeah, I guess it helps with your strength. I think I handed you the card back. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, it makes you, if you want to be a little pack mule, go ahead. Maybe put a glove on over it, though. Good. What? Why? <laughs> that's that's red as heck. Mm. I mean, we get mm. to... Yeah. Yeah, I guess. You don't want to be strong? I am strong. <laughs> <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> and I like that. <laughs> oh, wow. These sailor rings, though. This allows you to breathe underwater. What? <gasps> I mean, uh, yeah. Uh, I'll go <laughs> back to the get my get my own. Uh, but remember, you can only wear two. Is so it pick your two? Is it a style thing? Is oh, it, it's a magical load thing. Oh, okay, got it. It wouldn't be. It's not just like you would look weird having oh, no, a bunch no, of. No, not at all. <laughs> okay, I will be taking Suvi's uh, suggestion. So on 
uh, his left middle finger, he'll wear the uh, the sailor's ring, mm-hmm. and on his right index finger, he'll wear the copper ring. Gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. The scout's ring. Yeah. The scout's ring. Incredible. This is fascinating, the amount of power that is in these permanently. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Incredible. Um, I would love to take one of the bronze rings um, so I can carry a lot of different things. I could wrestle so many goats what? with this ring. I would also like to get a scout oh, ring because I could do with a little more vigilance. Uh, do these rings feel any sort of way, putting them on? What I would actually love for you to do is to give me a constitution saving throw. Okay, why did I ask? That's a seven. Uh, you put the copper ring on and the sensation is not actually a terrible one as you put it on. I think that constitution save means you're just very, um, you feel the stimulation of the magical effects taking over you very palpably. You're not mm. you're not guarded to the change in your like physiology. However, you put on the scout's ring and immediately the way you feel is just a little bit um, buzzed in a kind of caffeinated mm. way. You find yourself with an abundance of f- focus mm. uh, that doesn't feel unpleasant, but you find yourself noting more things. You're you're not getting distracted mm. very easily as you wear this ring. So, uh, whereas before putting all your focus into a ring, you notice the ring, but you also notice the two soldiers walking by in the courtyard. You notice uh, a sort of creak in a hallway outside. Ugh. It's uh, it is a little, but it's, I, think, I think Arslan takes the ring off like it, for a second, just like, and you see him like shaking okay? his hand. It's um, it is it is palpable the the difference. Oh. Ugh. Ugh. Uh, and then I'm going to try. Try to yawn. If you can pop your ears, kind of helps. Oh, okay. Yes. <laughs> oh. <laughs> ah. Ah. <laughs> ah. Ah. <laughs> I, uh, this that is where it does make his, your ears pop. His <laughs> specific physiology as a spirit, maybe. <laughs> ah. ah. What is, I, I'm not getting the popping you were talking oh, about. I'm sorry. I got to have oh. some gum here. Hold on. Ami, do you have any gum? Do you have like a oh, chewy food? Uh, spearmint? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, I also have fruit. Um, so, <laughs> which one? I think Ursula just starts Huge smacking. Wind, yeah. but Huge just wind most, energy. Oh, I also have fruit. <laughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't make him pop his ears, but it is just nice to focus on something else. <laughs> um, I, I would like, I also, so I take a bronze ring and a copper ring. Um, I take an extra um, bronze ring and I I check it. Is it, would it be okay for non-humans to wear it? I don't know if you know. I don't know if you know offhand. You can give me an arcana check if you want. Oh boy. That's a one. Do you slide a bronze ring onto your finger before sort of questioning what it would do to, to something else? Yes, yes. I, I poke a I, I poke a digit into it tentatively. Um, it feels like touching a source of electricity. If, and it's in that way that it numbs. It's not pain, but boy, is it an unpleasant sensation. Uh, and you start to sweat profusely and feel sick to your stomach. Oh. Oh, okay. She wants some spearmint and fruit to help. Oh, okay. Why are you all? Um, uh, go ahead and give me a history check. <laughs> Uh, oh, Suvi, go ahead and give me a history. Oh, me. Story. Okay, sorry. 20. 30, 20. Uh, you uh, you uh, recognize that um, one of the adv- pieces of advice they give to soldiers in the Azure Battalion is not to take these rings off lightly. Um, and you also remember that when on the first day they get them, they're not assigned anything. You think that the first day of wearing these, you are oh. pretty, it's a pretty intense process of like... a accepting and assimilating and, and dealing with the effect of the ring. Uh, uh, there's a bit of a... That's okay. You good? It's kind, I, of yeah, a, kind of gotta, a curve. I've got I I rummage through my pouches and pull out my herbalism kit and I pop some ginger into my mouth and start chewing it up. 
Okay, I'm fine. This is fine. It'll be fine. Hey, uh, Fox. Yeah. What? Um, how would you like to mitigate some harm, uh, with with a little experiment that might make you a little uncomfortable? No. (laughs) That's fair. I respect your bodily autonomy. Great. Because I can smell you sweating, and I don't want to do whatever it is. You okay. <laughs> Ami. Yes. Yeah. Were you going to put one of the rings on the fox? Only if he wanted it. How <sighs> cool would it be if we had a strong-ass fox? That's a good point. Hey, fox. Yeah. Uh, please let me put one of these rings on you. What do I get in return? Uh, you want some more of that fish slurry from earlier? Give me a persuasion check. <laughs> We're both looking Perfect. at him. <laughs> Seven. Let me be clear. I don't, I'm never putting, I'm, I, I, I should have made this clear the moment we met. I'm never putting clothes on. And that's Aww. clothes. Yeah. All right. Look, I'm just going to say, I'm so glad you're here with me. But if I had known that going into this, <laughs> things might have turned out a little different. Ooh. Tough break. Oh, Tough break, boss. I can't choose your family. Yeah. Um, yeah. <laughs> do you uh, you put on the coral ring as well, or something? Yes. Uh, you put on the, the coral ring and do not have any such reaction to it. It feels there. You don't feel any change on your body as you put the coral ring on. I want to say very specifically, Suvi didn't take anything because of the like ledger optics of if it looks like she took something too, and that the that somehow like a wizard of the Citadel was ill-equipped. Yes. <sighs> Which is obnoxious. <laughs> Copy that. I hear you. Suvi and Ursulan both see uh, see Ame stealing something from the uh, room. Erica just passed me a little note, but the roll was not <laughs> high enough. Uh, what do you steal with an emblem on it? Do you steal one of the boots or do you steal a jacket or something? Uh, just a jacket, I yeah. think. Steal a little jacket. Shove it into my back. Suvi like marks something down into the ledger, but does not say anything. Uh, Ursulan looks to see Suvi sees that she doesn't mind it and thinks. Oh, Suvi minds. Like you can see it in her face. She's pissed off at this, but she's not going to say anything. So all of you leave this area. You have a little while uh, before, uh, you have a little while before the boats leave. What do you do in the intervening? Ame, you feel sick as hell. I'm going to take a little nappy nap. Cool. Ame goes to take a nap. Uh, and just double checking again one time. Two copper rings, one coral ring, one bronze ring, and a jacket and a pair of bracers. Yes. Did we not take any of the witchfire veils? Did you explain I, I took, the witchfire? I took uh, four uh, the witchfire veils. And then uh, you said one one matchstick? And a, and a matchstick if you want it. Okay. Take yeah. the matchstick. I took the matchstick. Cool. Well, our first big getting of cool magical gear. There it is. is. Give me some water, bro. (laughs) Now I need water. (laughs) You spend some time, and actually, uh, you all do take an hour to uh, attune to your magical gear, which is sort of what this process is. Um, Your attunement, Ursulon, is just getting used to the new sort of amount of, like, sensory information. Mm -hmm. Oh, and I was just going to say that Ursulon spends that time drinking wine, trying to, like, meet in some kind of middle of, like, I don't want to be able to hear everything. Uh, (laughs) Uh, But you can also feel the coral ring. You do sort of feel a... There's something sort of, like, interesting in this. I think you feel the quality, like, inside of your glamour, you feel the quality of your fur change a little bit. There's Mm. something to your plumage and your fur where it becomes... Not in an unpleasant way. Uh, it it shines a little more as you realize that there's kind of a healthy natural oil on it. There's something mm-hmm. that like makes it a little bit more almost like a, a polar bear or an otter's fur or something like that. That if you were to suddenly submerge, you would not soak. Instead, <gasps> it would sleeken. It would become mm-hmm. like a little. It would be very easy to become a otter. Ursa Lauder. Ursa Lauder. <laughs> like water off a nurse salon's back. <laughs> uh, uh, I want to say during that time, I absolutely uh, attempted to fully pack the whatever uh, that like flower pressed book that Morrow gave me. I'm trying to keep it. 
So I'm like packing it into my stuff. It's mine now. Got you. So you did not open it. You're just packing it away. Yeah, that hour wasn't enough time. I think she's got other stuff on her mind and she didn't want to get lost in this before going and doing something else. Uh, incredible. Go ahead and give me either stealth or sleight of hand as you attempt to like conceal it in your belongings. 13. 13. Okay, copy that. You go ahead and conceal this sort of pressed tome inside. Uh, Ame, fox, the fox is right on your bed looking at you with this really concerned thing. You are sweating. You feel nauseous. Um, because you also, I believe, put on a copper ring as well, right? Yeah. Okay, so you're having full sensory stuff as you get advantage on perception and initiative, and you have this bronze ring on. Um, <laughs> so I don't know how to tell you this, Erica. After an hour's nap, you do get up and uh, actually give me a constitution saving throw. <laughs> That's a 13. Okay. On a 13, you miraculously do not have to get up and go to the privy to to uh, expel what you ate or drank, but it's close. There's a couple times where you're like holding your stomach and you're like, do I get up and make a run for it? Just dry hitting a little. Uh, rally. <laughs> you can rally. <laughs> um, and Ame, you, uh, after about an hour, this, and you realize like 45 minutes into it, you're just, you have a full fever. Oh, um, I'm, I'm going to sip some wizard Gatorade. Yeah. Oh, you're like, you have your little ginger witch yeah, drink. Ginger, ginger shots and uh, a little wizard Gatorade. Yeah. By the way, I'll say this. When they give these rings out, they tell you not to put both on in the same day, yeah. for sure. Um, so uh, you get up. Once again, like more things in focus, more things align. You're way more perceptive. And you look in a mirror after an hour. As you get up and are like changing out of your truly soiled, like sweat soaked clothing, um, you have lats. <gasps> you just fully have lats. You like turn your arm and have like a shredded fucking tricep. Uh, you, as you like bend down to get more clothes, there's like definition in your quads. You are, there is nothing. Uh, Ame now has a strength score of 19. Let's <laughs> go. Bam! Let's go. That's higher than Ursula. <laughs> uh, yeah, you have a you have a steward's ring on, and it is it's fucked up. It's you are you are jacked as hell. Um, Let's go. Uh, uh, I spend a little bit of time flexing. Yeah, in the mirror. This feels real good. Uh, incredible. I grew up my whole life on a farm, wrangling animals and chopping wood, but like now it's aesthetic. <laughs> your muscles. Yeah. Uh, yeah, you've. I mean, like your biggest impediment has always been your your actual physical stature, <laughs> and yeah. it doesn't seem to be a problem Muscle. anymore. Let's uh, go. Now I am a five foot shit. Brick house. Oh my god. <laughs> Shit, brick house. <laughs> um, incredible. Um, night falls, and uh, all of you have dinner brought to your rooms. Uh, and as you uh, sort of, you know, ready yourselves, um, a carriage pulls up outside. Do you all enter and head to the harbor? Are we feeling good? You look like shit. Does. This looks shitty to you, and I pull back a sleeve and flex. Yikes! I go to grab your muscle, but you're still <laughs> fever sweating, and I'm like, kind of a mixed bag. I agree. <laughs> is, that, is that the ring? Mm -hmm. I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Fox, that could be you. Honestly, I think this in this moment, I'm very glad we did not give the fox a ring. <laughs> Wait, I want one. <laughs> no, no, you don't. Hey, give me one. He I want to be. Want, he said he wants a ring. Do you all want to see a fox with <laughs> with abdominal muscles? Is that what you I want? I Why do is that not. even a question? Absolutely don't. Absolutely, it was bad enough when we gave him a vote. Right? <laughs> he ate his vote. He doesn't have it anymore. You can eat your vote and have it too. <laughs> I don't like the fox telling me I'm wrong. Yeah, I think yeah, we should yeah. get on the carriage. <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> <laughs> All of you get on the carriage 
and proceed through Port Talon at night. Uh, a cool mist sort of rises up from the water of the harbor. Uh, you are going towards the interior harbor, uh, the one on sort of the inside of the curve of the Talon of Port Talon. And you move through cobblestone streets and beautiful, more like civic imperial buildings that have been built more recently. Uh, and you see a ship awaiting you out of the end of a long pier that goes all the way out towards like a tall ship that can take you all the way out towards the derrick. Um, the ship waiting for you is not some massive war galley. It is a tall ship, but it is a sort of frigate. It's one made for speed and for a smaller crew. As you travel past in the carriage, I would ask uh, for uh, Suvi to give me a perception check. Uh, okay, uh, 30, 20. You look at the governor's manor, and it is night, but you see that there are still some rooms that are alight with uh, citadel magic within the governor's manor. You see a citadel carriage outside of the governor's manor. Um, and on a dirty 20, I think you can see that the coachman of that Citadel carriage is leaning in and speaking to someone inside of the carriage. Oh, I gotta say it. I have the observant beat. If I can see someone's mouth, like mouth moving, can I read his <gasps> read lips? Read their lips from yeah. far away? You absolutely can. Yeah! That's the first time I've ever seen that come up. With that. Yay! <laughs> I've never been more excited to remember how my feet work. You see that the coachman is saying, as you wish, Abdurra Galani. I believe that they should be outside sooner rather than later. Uh, I heard word from someone at the Scepter's Chorus Chantry that there was some, and at that point you're pulling around the corner. Oh, God, what was that? <sighs> Hey, y'all. Yes? Do you remember the three wizards that were mentioned in the Ace of Wands? Yeah. Not really, but... Uh, Moral and Pain and Kalani. Kalani. And I point back towards the governor's manor. Is there? I don't know if that's important, but that's... That's a citadel wizard. Well, this could be nothing. You're a, you're a citadel wizard. And it's very weird that I'm here. Mm. Galani is someone you've met before. Ooh. And I've... I know them. They're... Is it bad that... I mean, we already flubbed our cover story one time. It's is true. it? Is it bad if we... No, they... I think Galani knows I'm here. I saw something uh, that the coachman mentioned uh, our chantry and something that went down. So I think word of... The unpleasantness is already at the governor's mansion. The unpleasantness. Uh, that's us to a T. <laughs> um, should we be on guard with this person? With everyone. Always. Oh. Okay, yeah, yeah, of course. Wizards are defined by their secrets. You continue along, uh, waiting, uh, avoiding... Uh, the eyes of the citadel. You arrive at the harbor, walk along the pier, and see out in the distance now, much more dramatic in the nighttime sea, purple and green. Lights pulsing out in the distance. Up on the deck of the ship, Guild Mage Moro clasps his hands. Ah! Welcome, welcome. A uh, lovely sea tide excursion. Uh, obviously, I know you've had your dinner already, but we do have some amenities and some uh, crudite waiting for us. On it's so the- kind of you. No, thank you. Oh. <laughs> oh I'm, I'm quite all right. Uh, very well. Um, you see that he uh, invites you onto the deck of the ship. And you hear the ropes unwinding with some careful mage hand spells from the sailors around. And as you take off, the ship begins sailing. Moro stands near the prow, looking excitedly, walks over to you, Suvi. Uh, I wished to um, let you know that we were unable to apprehend the guild mage, Payne. Um, he uh, was alerted to his 
status somehow. Mm. Uh, and uh, <laughs> Ursulan and Ensley all may look um, at each other. Uh, however, uh, we've taken the liberty, and you see he holds up a small parchment that has a magically conjured sort of etching of Payne's face, and it says, uh, wanted for crimes against the Imperium for the bounty of 750 Imperial Marks. Uh, we've taken the liberty of uh, putting these up across town. Wonderful. Uh, he, without a traveling door, he won't be able to get far. I consider this handled. He smiles and says, wonderful. Now, <laughs> to the main event. Oh, I am so excited. I, truth be told, I have longed to be in the company of a true wizard. And uh, though I know, uh, of course, that um, you are uh, still in your apprenticeship, I think the writing is on the wall that you will be a great wizard of this age. And I am so excited to see what is to come. CV nods graciously. <laughs> Just a little asshole. The ship arrives at the derrick, and as you come closer, you see a structure that has four inclined massive steel beams that all come to a central point. It is effectively the shape of a pyramid, but in an incredibly acute isosceles formation. So a tall and narrow pyramid of steel, uh, except hollow. So only the corners are these like four steel beams that come down. And uh, set between them, you see that they are platforms ascending up, covered in lights. The platforms appear to be both structural, like helping hold and secure this magical derrick. And you also notice that there's not anything ostentatious going on here. Like the platforms are secured structurally to the outer beams. There are some railings for safety on the edge of the platform. But within them, you see that there are uh, the basics of rune work within platforms going up. And each of the platforms holds, uh, as you arrive up on the outside, there's a staircase going up, like zigzagging up across from platform to platform, going way, way up high. In the center of each steel platform is a circular disc of gl glass, or if it's crystal, oh. it's perfectly transparent crystal. But it basically creates the circumstance of that whatever floor you're on, you can walk out into that disc of glass and look straight up and see all the way up to the central lights at the top that you see are these massive stacked purple and green that you can now see are perfect um, octagonal prisms. So like an octagon cylinder into octagonal points that flow. So it's like a little prism, right? Um, the, they hover up at the top of this derrick shape. Uh, and the light from them cascades down through all of those lenses. And you see the sort of strange effect all through all these lenses is that the actual water, as the beams go into the sea itself, that there is this incredibly bright green and purple light illuminating the gentle waves rolling underneath the derrick, really like illuminating the sea which also has the effect of making all the sea around it incredibly dark, that you kind of, like that light is so powerful that it's blinding what you'd normally be able to see. As you arrive and the ship is anchored, uh, Moro says, ah, welcome, welcome to the Calibel Nautomantic Apparatus. It is a pleasure and honor and a privilege, which I know I have said altogether too many times, but and you can see here he trembles with emotion. He says, right this way, um, takes you to uh, the staircase, and you can see uses for the first time his own magic. He casts a spell that kind of creates a floating platform of force underneath you so that you don't have to ascend this like long staircase yourselves. Um, as you begin to float up the staircase on this platform of force, he just begins to point things out to you. He's like, uh, and as you get up, the wind kind of kicks up going higher and higher. The sea wind really starts to 
get more intense. So sort of speaking over the wind, he starts to go like, the construction of the actual apparatus took uh, approximately three and a half years. The enchanting could begin within the last year, but we needed to wait until it was fully uh, stable and operational before the real enchantments, the prisms you see up above, could actually be called into effect. It's a, a, an incredible uh, testament to the work of the engineers and the various uh, mage rights that were able to come in and, and uh, build this here. Uh, I really can't wait to show you. Um, you arrive at the uppermost platform. which at this point is about, you know, still 80 or so feet uh, underneath the top. You're probably like 160 feet up above the ocean. You're high, high, mm. high up. Um, and uh, as you are up on this, this last platform is probably like 30 feet by 30 feet. Like it is narrow up here, right? So it's pretty, pretty cozy. And you see this big disc of crystal, pure, like flawless, completely translucent in the center of the steel platform. The platforms, of course, are, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Not corrugated. The, the platforms have lots of slots in them, like a, almost like a chain link fence. What was the one looking for? Like a grate. Yeah, They're, yeah, yeah. Yeah, the, the, the steel platforms are graded to A, make them easier to lift. They're lighter, uh, but B, also for water and things like that. So you're on this graded steel platform that goes out to this disc in the middle. And you see Maro looks at you and says, um, and of course... We built the derrick, enchanted it, and then it was just a, a matter of time before we could <sighs> set into motion what we knew was possible given studies of the opportunity given to us by Port Talon and what the locals had often spoken about they only knew a fraction of. There is something truly worthwhile, but explaining it to you would rob you of the wonder of what we first found when we came out here. So, without further ado, if you would step on to the disc, we will go ahead and let the show begin. I don't hesitate. Uh, I'm in lockstep. I pause for a moment. This is all so fascinating and impressive, but there's just something in my stomach that feels bad, and it's not the result of the rings. Um, you feel that weirdness. You see Mara looks at you and says, um, if, if you're not feeling well, you're, you, you don't need to participate? Oh, no, no, that's all right. Sorry, yeah, it's just a, a little nausea. Uh, understood. Um, well. He claps, and you see that uh, a number of other attendant mages down below begin to swirl their hands and chant. Kim Whispers begin to echo out from the derrick. C kicks up a little bit as you see a group of wizards working in unison. Morrow looks up, touches his lower lip, speaks silently to himself. And you see the prisms begin to rotate overhead, causing the purple and green light to rotate on the sea floor underneath. You look and see the lenses shifting as the mages below begin to chant in unison light intensifies. Purple and green light mixing, swirling, becoming one blinding image. The waves kick up, the wind kicks up. You see white foam coming off the sea caps of the waves. Beneath you, the light is obscuring it, but you see that the foam is building and building and building. Suddenly you realize the light itself is swirling and creating a whirlpool underneath the derrick. But it's not a whirlpool of space, but one of 
light itself. The sea is flattened and illuminated as something neither water nor air is created. It is simply solid light itself taking the place of any other element and whoo, zooms down deep to the bottom of the ocean underneath, illuminating something deeper, deeper, deeper. You see the light, and now even the brightness of the gold light clears to actually pure crystal clarity. You can see exactly what you are meant to see standing here on the glass. Endless water parting and down another 80 or 100 feet beneath the surface. You see something enormous. At first, you wonder what it could be. A ship wrecked and scuttled on the bottom of the sea out beyond the bay? No, it's bigger than a ship. It's some kind of whale, some leviathan of the ancient See, and then you see it moves in something like a breath or a palpitation. There is a coloring to it. You're looking at red and cream stripes like waves and hundreds of tendrils. You look to find a face, but you can't see one. There is some massive monster at the bottom of the sea, surrounded by tall, dark ocean rocks in the depths. You see its tendrils. It is something like a lionfish faceless and oblong as a sea cucumber, larger than an ocean galley. At the front of its body, there is series of glowing bioluminescent lights, each larger than the wheel of a carriage, but on its massive frame, somehow small in comparison, that stretch back. You see, its long body curls almost like a nautilus, a tail that narrows, tucked in underneath itself, even though all of it is soft and writhing and palpitating in its massiveness. The lights, light crystal blue and then deep green and then bright red, scintillating along its body, a massive, ocean creature unlike any you have ever seen before. You see from underneath its massive frame, coral growing up from where its body touches underneath. And the source of the coral is some glimmering blue-white liquid that appears to shimmer iridescently like oil on the surface of water that soaks out from where its body touches the stone. And as it leaves, coral grows, spiking out in all directions, spiring up as though to reach out and rise up and in cover or in case or in clothes. And you see down there the base of the steel structure of the derrick. And clearly the coral is being carved off. You see structures and tools and implements at the base of the tower for carving the coral away. And you see the light. <laughs> As the light touches the creature, you see reverberating like sonic waves, the creature pushed down. <sighs> this tower reverberating with energy, its four po 
posts on either side of the creature at the bottom of the sea. You see, Maro smiles, weeping. What have you done? (laughs) We got it. We got it. That was Lou Wilson as Ursuline, Erica Ishii as Ame, Abria Iyengar as Suvi, and Brennan Lee Mulligan as everyone and everything else. Worlds Beyond Number is edited, designed, and scored by Taylor Moore at Fortunate Horse, with additional sound design from Michael Gelfi Studios. For even more like this, join us on our Patreon. We'll see you there.